The Orsay Museum, or Musée d'Orsay, houses French art of the 1800s, starring the Impressionists. It's the art of sun-dappled fields, bright colors, and crowded Parisian cafes. Hi, I'm Rick Steves. Thanks for joining me on a guided tour through the best general collection anywhere of Manet, Monet, Renoir, Degas, Van Gogh, Cezanne, and Gauguin. If you like Impressionism, visit this museum. If you don't like Impressionism, visit this museum. I personally find it a more enjoyable and rewarding place than the Louvre. Sure, you gotta see the Mona Lisa and Venus de Milo, but after you get your goddess out of the way, enjoy the Orsay. The 19th century was a mix of old and new, side by side. Europe was entering the modern industrial age with cities, factories, rapid transit, instant communication, and global networks. At the same time, it clung to the past with traditional, rural, almost medieval attitudes and morals. So, the Orsay shows art that's also both old and new, conservative and revolutionary. Wander among the main floor's gallery of gleaming white statues. No, this isn't ancient Greece. These statues are from the same era as the theory of relativity. It's the conservative art of the French schools that was so popular throughout the 19th century. People loved this stuff because it's beautiful. With the balanced poses, perfect anatomy, sweet faces, curving lines, and creamy stone, it's all very appealing. I'll be bad-mouthing it later, but for now, appreciate the exquisite craftsmanship of this pretty and very conservative art. Jean-Auguste Dominique Angra, The Source, 1856. The Source is virtually a Greek statue on canvas. Like Venus de Milo, She's a balance of opposite motions. Angra worked on this for over 35 years and considered it his image of perfection. Famous in its day, the source influenced many artists whose classical statues and paintings are in this museum. Alexander Cabanel, The Birth of Venus, from 1863. This goddess is a perfect fantasy, an orgasm of beauty. The love goddess stretches back seductively, recently birthed from the ephemeral foam of a wave. Take a mental cold shower, and let's cross over to the wrong side of the tracks, to the art of the early rebels, the so-called realists. Honoré Daumier, Celebrities of the Happy Medium, from the 1830s. These 36 small portrait busts are a liberal's look at the stuffy bourgeois establishment that controlled the academy and the salon. Have some fun. Give a few nicknames yourself. Let's see. I spy a Reagan, Ronald Reagan. You mean the guy with the big swooping hairdo? Yep. And how about that guy with the doughy face? I'll call him Clinton. Bill, that is. Yeah. Jean-Francois Millet, The Gleaners, from 1867. Millet shows us three gleaners, the poor women who scavenged through the meager leftovers after a field had already been harvested for the wealthy. Instead of idealized gods, goddesses, nymphs, and winged babies, Millet painted simple rural scenes like this. Edward Manet, Olympia, 1863. This brunette is thoroughly ugly. Her face is stupid, her skin cadaverous. All this clash of colors is stupefying. So wrote a critic when Edward Manet's nude hung in the salon. The public hated it, attacking Manet in print and literally attacking the canvas. Think back to Cabanel's painting The Birth of Venus, an idealized pastel Vaseline on the lens beauty, soft core pornography, the kind you see selling lingerie and perfume. Manet's nude doesn't gloss over anything. The pose is classic, used by Titian, Goya, and countless others. But this is a realist's take on the classics. The sharp outlines and harsh, contrasting colors are new and shocking. Her hand is a clamp, and her stare is shockingly defiant, with not a hint of the seductive, hey sailor look of most nudes. This prostitute, ignoring the flowers sent by her last customer, looks out at us, as if to say, next... Manet 
replaced softcore porn with hardcore art. The Opera Exhibit Hover over this scale model section of Paris. This is the neighborhood around the Garnier Opera House. Find the Opera House in the center with its green domed roof. Notice the wide straight boulevards and the uniform height of the buildings. This was state of the art in the 19th century. This part of Paris had recently undergone an urban renewal that cleaned out its tangle of medieval lanes. The centerpiece was the Opera House. Grand View of the Orsay Survey what was once an immense train station. Trains used to run right under our feet down the center of the gallery. At the far end, Parisians bought their tickets, glanced up at the big clock, and hustled down the steps to the platforms. This former train station barely escaped the wrecking ball in the 1970s, when the French realized it'd be a great place to house the enormous collections of 19th century art that were scattered throughout the city. Impressionism features bright colors, easygoing open-air scenes, spontaneity, broad brushstrokes, and the play of light. The Impressionists made their canvases shimmer by using a simple but revolutionary technique. Let's say you mix red, yellow, and green together. You'll get brown, right? But Impressionists didn't bother to mix them. They'd slap a thick brush stroke of yellow down, then a stroke of green next to it, then red next to that. Up close, all you see are three messy strokes. But as you back up, voila, brown. The colors blend in your eye at a distance. But while your eye is saying, bland old brown, your subconscious is shouting, wow, red, yellow, green, yes. The camera threatened to make artists obsolete. Now, a machine could capture a better likeness than the finest painter, faster than you could say, etch-a-sketch. But of course, true art is more than just painting reality. It gives us reality from the artist's point of view with the artist's personal impressions of the scene. A shocked public looked at this and wondered, what are these scantily clad women doing with these men? Or rather, what will they be doing after the last baguette is eaten? It wasn't the nudity, but the presence of the men in ordinary clothes that suddenly made the nudes look naked. Once again, the public judged the painting on moral rather than artistic terms. Let's start with Claude Monet. Yeah, baby, show me the Monet. Oh, brother. Claude Monet is the father of Impressionism. He fully explored the possibilities of open-air painting and tried to faithfully reproduce nature's colors with bright blobs of paint. In the 1860s, Monet, along with Renoir, began painting landscapes in the open air. In fact, it was one of Monet's canvases of an impression that gave the movement its name, Impressionism. In these same rooms are works by Monet's friend, Renoir. Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Dance at the Moulin de la Galette, 1876. On Sunday afternoons, working-class folk would dress up and head for the fields on a hill overlooking Paris called Montmartre. It's near the sacre Coeur Basilica. Here they'd dance, drink, and eat little crepes called galettes until dark. Renoir liked to go there to paint the common Parisians living and loving in the afternoon sun. The sunlight filtering through the trees creates a kaleidoscope of colors— like a 19th-century disco ball, throwing darts of light onto the dancers. Renoir captures the dappled light with quick blobs of yellow dancing on the ground, the men's jackets, and the sun-dappled straw hat. Degas blends classical lines with Impressionist color, spontaneity, and everyday subjects from urban Paris. Degas loved the unposed snapshot effect. His well-known statue, Tiny Dancer, 14 years old, is in the glass case. Degas' snapshots captured the highs and lows of Parisian life. In his work In a Café, also known as The Glass of Absinthe, a weary lady of the evening meets morning with a last, lonely, coffin-nail drink 
in the glaring light of a four-in-the-morning cafe. The pale green drink forming the center of the composition is that toxic substance, absinthe. That's the drink that fueled many artists and burned out many more. Impressionists have been accused of being lightweights. The colorful style lends itself to bright country scenes, gardens, sunlight on the water, and happy crowds of simple people. It took a remarkable genius to add profound emotion to the Impressionist style. Vincent van Gogh, or van Hoch, as the Dutchman himself would have pronounced it, like Michelangelo, Beethoven, Rembrandt, Wayne Newton, and a select handful of others, put so much of himself into his work that art and life became one. At first, he paints like the others, but soon he develops his own style. By using thick, swirling brushstrokes, he infuses life into even inanimate objects. Van Gogh's brushstrokes curve and thrash, like a garden hose pumped with wine. Paul Gauguin Gauguin got the travel bug early in childhood and grew up wanting to be a sailor. Instead, he became a stockbroker. In his spare time, he painted and was introduced to the Impressionist circle. He learned their bright, clashing colors, but took a different path just about the time Van Gogh waved a knife in his face. At the age of 35, he got fed up with it all, quit his job, abandoned his family, his wife's stern portrait bust may be nearby, and took refuge in his art. Auguste Rodin The sculptor was born of working-class roots and was largely self-taught. He labored in obscurity for decades. Finally, by age 40, he started to gain recognition. Rodin's subject was always the human body. He depicted people in unusual poses that expressed their inner emotion. Rodin became the greatest sculptor since Michelangelo. Head toward the large ornamental doorway studded with statues. It's the gates of hell. Yikes. Do we have to? Rick, it's just art. Okay. Rodin worked for decades on these doors, depicting what Dante saw on his trip through hell. In this one work, Rodin did 186 different figures, exploring the entire range of human experience. The door contains some of Rodin's greatest hits. These are small versions of statues he later did in full size. The Thinker. He sits, squatting above the doorway, contemplating man's fate. This two-foot-tall figure was the inspiration for the large-scale version that has become one of the most celebrated statues in the world. The thinker was meant to represent Dante himself pondering the poor souls down in hell. 